Good day everyone, and welcome to Lubrication Explained. In this video, we're going to discuss ICP and what it means for used oil analysis results. So ICP is a really common method for testing a lot of the parameters that you'll see on a used oil analysis report. In fact, your wear metals, contaminants, and additives are almost all tested by this method. Uh, so that makes it really important because it comprises almost half of all the results that you'll see on a typical used oil analysis report. The exception to these is chlorine, uh, that's usually done by x-ray, but almost all the other elements are tested by this method. So it's really important. Um, one thing to know, obviously, it's the measurement is in parts per million, um, and it gives a whole bunch of different metals which could mean different things for different applications. Um, but it is very widely used, and so in some ways it's really important that we understand how the test is done and what that really means for you. So ICP is inductively coupled plasma spectroscopy. Um, that's what ICP stands for. But the actual tests that can be done using this method, we have inductively coupled plasma mass spectroscopy, and we also have atomic emission spectroscopy, and this is the one that's most commonly used in used oil analysis labs. Sometimes it'll be called inductively coupled plasma uh, optical emission spectroscopy, um, but most frequently it's ICP by AES. What it's used for is, and what it's really good for, is analyzing a whole bunch of different elements uh, simultaneously. So with one sample, you can get a lot of different results at the same time uh, using the same equipment. It's also very fast, it's quite accurate, um, and it also analyzes both organic and inorganic samples to the parts per million level. It's not just oil analysis that takes advantage of these uh, testing methods, so you can test um, a variety of different materials. The key is that it needs to be soluble because um, the sample needs to be um, kind of aerosolized uh, in order to get a good reading. So let's kind of talk through the different elements of ICP AES and explain what they mean individually. So the first thing to, to kind of cover would be what is plasma because uh, maybe it's not a state of matter that everyone's all that familiar with. So plasma is actually the fourth state of matter. The ones we're all familiar with are obviously, uh, materials are usually solid at cold temperatures. And as you increase the temperature, that, or increase, if you like, the internal energy of the system, they generally become liquids. Not always the case. So we know that dry ice, for example, goes straight from being a solid to a gas. That's a process called sublimation. But in most instances, you'll go from a solid to a liquid. And by putting more energy into the system, you're sort of um, loosely breaking the bonds, if you like, uh, between the, the, the different molecules, and it allows them to sort of flow past each other. As you raise the temperature, liquids generally become gases, which again, further breaks the bonds between them and allows them to occupy whatever space they're in. You get a lot more dispersion and a lot more movement because we put a lot more energy into the system. If we were to continue putting energy into the system and raise the temperature even further, what we get is a state of matter that's called plasma. And this is where the bonds between the electrons and the rest of the nucleus actually, uh, in some ways, get broken. And so plasma is a state where you have positively charged cations, uh, or that is to say the nucleus of, of these atoms, and free electrons kind of all flowing, um, all flowing together. So in many ways, they are a little bit like a gas in the sense that they flow freely, uh, but there is a lot more um, charged particles. We are actually familiar with some examples of plasma. So lightning, for example, um, the temperatures in lightning are high enough that that is effectively plasma. Uh, nuclear fireballs are another example of plasma. And so is solar wind. So we do come across them, but maybe we don't interact with these in our everyday lives. So now let's talk about inductively coupled plasma and what that means. So in an ICP setup, what we effectively have is a burner. 
But unlike, let's say, a Bunsen burner um, that we had in, in high school chemistry, this one is uh, a burner that generates extremely high temperatures in a very controlled way. The way that that's achieved is uh, we put argon gas through the system. Uh, and so I'm going to represent that with some green circles and say that they're argon atoms. Argon um, will then actually put... Uh, there's, there's an induction coil around the system and uh, we'll put a current through that which is going to generate a magnetic field. We'll then introduce a spark so that's putting some energy into the system and that helps to decouple the electrons from their cations and you get the beginnings of plasma. The electrons are then accelerated by the magnetic field and so they gain a little bit more energy and so as they start to move about, they generate even more plasma to the point where it basically becomes a sort of a self-sustaining thing and you get a bit of a plasma cloud in the system. What we then do is we inject the sample and the sample has been aerosolized. So it's, in, uh, it's kind of atomized and we spray it through this argon cloud. What that's going to do is enable the sample to get into contact with the extremely high temperatures of the plasma, um, but argon gas is not going to uh, interact with that sample too much. And it gives us a really good bright flame. So that's what the inductively coupled plasma part of ICP AES really means. Now, how do we get information out of that? Well, now let's talk about the AE part of this. This is the atomic emission. So let's go back to some high school chemistry and consider the hydrogen atom. So hydrogen has a nucleus, which is in hydrogen's case, just a proton. And around it, you have these, if you like, uh, electron shells, which are these places, if you like, not physical places, but they occupy an energy space that an electron can sit in. And under certain models, so this is the Bohr model of the atom, we would say that the electron orbits uh, the nucleus um, at a certain, if you like, distance. Now, if we put some energy into the system with a, with a photon, we can cause that electron to jump up a level, right? And it will then circulate around uh, the proton at that level. And if that electron were to come back down, it would emit a photon of exactly the same energy. So it's a, it's a fixed amount. You can't have an electron jump by half a level or a quarter of a level. But if we were to put a photon with higher energy into the system, so at a, um, a higher frequency or shorter wavelength, what we could do is cause that electron to jump into a higher shell or a higher energy state. And again, when that electron comes back down, um, it will emit a photon of that equivalent energy. So this is what atomic emission is. And all the different uh, atoms within the periodic table have a unique sort of uh, set of uh, energy uh, spaces, if you like. So now what does that mean for spectroscopy? So this is the S of the ICP AES. So we have atoms that have been um, aerosolized from our sample, have been shot through the plasma, that has put a lot of energy into them, and they are now going to have electrons that are being both excited and dropping down in energy levels as well, which is going to cause the sample to emit lots of photons of different wavelengths. Now those photons are light. Right? So what we can do is we can set up a slit experiment where the light from the sample is going to pass through the slits and we can then diffract it uh, using a prism. Something that you probably would have done in high school physics. And that's going to split the light into its component wavelengths. We can then um, record where those wavelengths occur and that gives us our emission spectra uh, for the sample. Now, each atom has its own unique emission spectra, 
And it's from analyzing this spectra that we were able to identify uh, what elements are actually in the sample. The other thing that's worth notice, noting is, I guess, the tolerance and bounds. So what are we capable of measuring? Generally, for most of the different elements, we can measure between 1 and 5,000 ppm. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Um, for various reasons, lithium, for example, caps out at around 300 parts per million. Um, but we don't typically see that much lithium in uh, oil analysis samples unless maybe there's some contamination with a, a, a lithium or a lithium complex grease. And calcium can actually be tested to a much higher threshold. So, so we can test from anywhere from 1 uh, to about uh, 20,000 uh, parts per million in that case. However, for most of the elements that we are concerned with, so whether that be wear metals, uh, contaminants, or additives, generally this range of 1 to 5,000 is, is going to be sufficient. So as an example, a, a really heavily additized engine oil will have zinc that is in the order of 1,000 to maybe 1,500 parts per million. Um, but typically you would see zinc at, at much lower values than that. So 1 to 5,000 gives us a, a, a great uh, range for us to do all those tests. The accuracy is pretty good too. So typically less than you know 5% um, is the tolerance that we would put around it. And so if you're testing anywhere between, let's say, one and a hundred parts per million, then only five percent uh, is is a high degree of accuracy. So I hope that this has given you a bit of a flavor for um, the ICP methods that are used in used oil analysis laboratories and given you an idea for how it's achieved um, and why it's so important to our used oil analysis results. This has been Lubrication Explained. <laughs>